You know, it's easy to stand tall and be brave when everything is going your way. But when disaster strikes, when sickness, an accident, a loss of a job or the death of a family member or a close friend happens, then there is suddenly a world that doesn't feel so solid anymore. There's a popular praise and worship song that's heard in many congregations today. Jennifer LaMontagne wrote the lyrics to a song called I Am Determined as an answer to times of doubt or weakness of faith, of simply being human. Here's the first verse in the chorus. Darkness around me, sorrow surrounds me. Though there be trials, still I can sing. For I have this treasure, my God reigns within me. And I am determined to live for the King. I'm determined to be invincible till he has finished his purpose in me. And nothing shall shake me, for he'll never forsake me, and I am determined to live for the King. What awesome messages are contained in those few lines. In spite of trials and sorrows, your heart can sing if you know, and you know that you know, that God through his Holy Spirit reigns within you. That knowledge gives you the determination to live for him. Of course, there's going to be times when you and I waver and, and we grow weak in the knees. And as you will see, we're not alone, for the Bible is filled with the stories of vulnerable moments in the lives of even the saints. But the true test is the faith and strength of conviction to pick oneself up, dust yourself off, and then rejoin the battle and finally win your crown. I want you to listen to the words again of this chorus. I am determined to be invincible till he has finished his purpose in me. And nothing, nothing will shake me for he'll never forsake me. I'm determined to live for my king. How magnificent to have the faith to believe in and to live by those words. Note that the songwriter understands that we are to endure to the end till he has finished his purpose in me. She also recognizes that God will not allow his faithful to be shaken, and he will never ever forsake those who believe in him. Ah, uh, but there is one group of beings, creatures, that fear the strong and faithful believer. Listen to this next verse. Hell's gates are trembling from our prayers ascending. Darkness is crumbling from praises we sing. Our sovereign, victorious, is marching before us, and we are determined to live for the king. The devil and his minions shudder to hear our prayers, for he uses tools of doubt and of fear to erode our faith. Happiness determination, accomplishment, all of those are targets, fulfillment. See, wars are always fought with weapons, mostly material ones like guns and swords, ships and planes. The army of evil, however, attacks the heart and attacks the mind with weapons of doubt and fear. But God is on our side and gives us armor against such weapons. Read the description of his protective measures. You'll find that in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. You see, darkness flees when the light of Jesus Christ illuminates our path and takes us through the low valleys of our lives. Satan and his demons are no match for a determined human spirit bolstered by the unconquerable Holy Spirit of God. Once we grasp that truth, we can begin to experience the life that Jesus Christ intends for us to have. What would you give to face tomorrow knowing that you are invincible, 
not because of who you are, but because of whom you belong to. You see, you and I were bought with a price more priceless than all of creation, the sinless life of our Creator. Think about this. If our King loved us so much that He was willing to die for us, then we must love our King enough to live for Him. It is He who erases our doubts. It is He who calms our fears. And it is He who has the power. And how do we know that? Because it was He who conquered death. That's the final enemy of man. Occasionally, I have the honor to perform special music in my church and at community concerts. And one song that I do that I love that reminds me of the power of Jesus' resurrection is a favorite entitled, Behold. Listen to the words of this second verse. Behold the tomb where Jesus lay. Behold that stone, it's been rolled away. Behold his resurrection power, why he lives again. Yes, he lives this hour. Can we even grasp the smallest degree of hope and inspiration in that verse? Listen, Jesus, Son of God, creator of the universe and all that is within, came to this infinitesimal speck of sand called earth, grew into sinless manhood, suffered torture that few could ever survive, and then was nailed through his hands and feet and left to hang and die to pay for the sins of all mankind. If he had not been resurrected, we would have no hope of life eternal. But listen, he was raised up, and nothing can affect us that cannot be overcome through his resurrection power. Do you have any doubts that haunt you this day? If you do, be of good cheer, for you are in good company. Moses was perhaps one of the most dynamic figures in biblical history. He stood up to the Pharaoh, giving up his place in the royal household to free Israelite slaves. He faced off against the magicians. He faced off against the army and even the Israelites that he had fought to lead to freedom. And yet, this man had recurring doubts about his ability to lead. He used every excuse in the book to get out of serving God in the enormous task that was set before him. Perhaps you and I would have some hesitation if faced with leading several millions of men, women, and children out of slavery, surrounded by one of the most powerful rulers and armies of that time. Listen to what Moses said to God as recorded in Exodus 3.11. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Moses then said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and, and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell him? Of course, we know God told him, I am. But still, Moses wavered and tried yet another excuse. He then told God that he doubted he would be effective in speaking and tried to hide behind his speech difficulties. In Exodus 4, verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And finally, with seemingly no shame, Moses displayed his human weakness. But Moses said, O oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. Well, God was having nothing to do with Moses wavering. With patience and love, he rebutted every single doubt that Moses raised. As the book of Exodus continues, his servant becomes bolder and filled with the confidence that comes from godly faith. Not the crumbling faith of man, but the eternal, unfailing, omnipotent faith of God dwelling within. 
You know, women have their doubts too. What about Sarah? You remember Abraham's wife? When told she would have a child at a very advanced age, she had natural doubts. Of course, the scripture says that her husband felt the same. As a matter of fact, Sarah more or less snickered at the thought of giving birth, while Abraham simply fell to the ground in laughter. Nonetheless, Isaac was born to them, and then the strength of Abraham's faith was tested on the mountain when God called for him to sacrifice his and Sarah's only son. It was a foretaste of God's own son being offered up on the cross. It was only at the last moment that God did intervene and save the boy. But Abraham passed the test and was forever known as father of the faithful. Remember Peter? He was ready to give up his life for Jesus right up until the moment that the Savior surrendered his last breath. And then doubt set in, and the apostle denied Jesus. And as the Savior foretold, Peter heard the rooster crow three times. The most famous reference, of course, is that of doubting Thomas. The disciple would not accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ until he placed his finger in the nail holes and his hand in the spear wound in the Savior's side. In defense of Thomas, he had not been in the room when Jesus first entered, and he hadn't witnessed all that the other disciples had seen or heard. An important point was made in this upper room, however. Jesus said to all of them gathered in the room, because you have seen me, and remember, he even entered through the walls. The door wasn't even open, and they saw him, and they believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He was speaking of those who would become believers later in those times, and he spoke of people like you and me today. Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? If so, you have a faith that is greater than that of the eyewitnesses in the upper room at that time. Now here's a question, how can you build on that faith to deal with the doubts in your day-to-day -day living? We'll get to that in a moment, but first let's examine a few typical doubts and their impact. Ignore any that don't pertain to you, but consider carefully the ones that do. Here's doubt number one, what I have to say is just not important. Never doubt the worthiness of your knowledge and its contribution to the rest of us. No one has ever lived your life. No one has ever looked at things exactly as you have. No one else can ever express your feelings. So don't doubt your value as a participant, but use wisdom in your speaking. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. See, God has given each of us a mind and a memory, and what would be the purpose of either if we didn't use it? Give me your insight, and I will give you mine, and our store of knowledge then becomes greater than that of just one alone. Here's a second doubt. I can't do this thing. You can fill any word to substitute that. I, I can't do this job. I can't learn to drive. I can't fix this car. I can't ride this bike. I can't learn to play the piano. I can't even pass the exam. I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, whether it's a test or a task or facing a trial, you're not alone if you put your faith in God. Sometimes he'll put things in your path to help you build character to face even greater mountains to climb in the future. But now think about this. How many times did you end up doing those very things that you couldn't do? Remember the hopelessness you felt the, the first time you faced a typewriter? That's for us older ones, not you younger ones, or a computer keyboard. Do you remember the helplessness when you strapped on your skates? Remember the fear of standing up before your schoolmates to recite? Think about that. And nothing erased doubt faster than the realization that your dad was no longer holding you up and you were balancing and actually pedaling and riding a two-wheel bike all by yourself, something you could never do. 
How about the uncertainty and the dry mouth that came reporting for a new job on your very first day? There was no way you could ever learn all there was to know. You just knew that you would be fired by the end of the week. Yet you did learn, didn't you? And over the years, you probably trained other equally scared recruits to do the same tasks, along with improvements that you made in the progress. Here's another doubt, doubt number three. I'll never get married. No one will ever want me. Well, it's probably a safe bet that most pastors and others in that position have heard that doubt expressed. It's also reasonable safe to say that he and his fellow pastors have officiated at weddings of those who doubted. There are many gold wedding bands to be found on the ring fingers of people in this audience who were so sure they would never find a mate. And that same holds true for many, like uh, Sarah, when she doubted that she could never have or could even adopt a baby. Most of these doubts are common to everyone, believers and non-believers alike. The big difference is in the knowing that there is a power greater than all the combined power of the universe and that this power is yours for the asking. That power is the indwelling spirit of God inside you. You've heard this from the psalm that David wrote, 23rd, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. But this power, this great indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, goes beyond dealing with the day-to-day -day doubts of life. Without the faith of Jesus Christ, there is nothing beyond this day, this hour, and this minute. Think about this. The non-believer with a serious illness must put his life in the hands of a person, a doctor, who may or may not have the skills to diagnose and prescribe the proper medicines of surgery to deal with the problem. On the other hand, the ill or injured believer can go to God and ask for his intervention in the healing of his or her body. And even if God's will is to declare a recall in your case, you know that your spirit will be recycled into an incorruptible body on that great getting up morning. Without faith, the non-believer looks forward only to a graveyard full of bones of failed bodies. Nothing more. Perhaps the toughest test of faith in your spirit in the struggle to conquer doubt is the sorrow at the death of a loved one. The believer knows that the departed is in the loving arms of God and that aside from the natural grief of survivors, there is a final victory. Death cannot claim us, for we have only to await our moment in sleep before being awakened to an eternity of joy if we believe. There are, however, I admit, spiritual doubts that a non-believer does not encounter, but which you, as a Christian, may. For instance, you may wonder if you have Jesus dwelling in you. Jesus said, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Have you done that? Have you indeed opened your heart's door and let him come in. Then fear not, for he is dwelling within you now. And you may even wonder if you're tapped into the power of the Holy Spirit. You remember when Jesus put out his hand and caused the fig tree to wither because it wasn't producing. His disciples looked on in wonder, and they asked, how this was so? And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. Now, I caution wisdom is to be applied to this. I don't want you to go out into the backyard and attack a mountain near your home. It's not time to do that. But God cannot lie, and when you need the power to do his will, you have it. 
Well, finally, you may wonder if you've been forgiven. David knew the way to forgiveness, even though his sins included adultery and murder. He wrote, Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. David said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. When you laid your sins at the feet of Jesus, they were removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Your past sins are gone forever, but because of our human frailties, yes, we will continue to sin. And nevertheless, he will continue to forgive as long as we confess our guilt and ask to have it removed from the record. Doubt destroys confidence, and it weakens your resolve. And God understands that, and he will not let Satan defeat you as long as you come to him for help. In Psalms, David revealed the many times he felt discouraged to the point of giving up. But he didn't. Why? Because through it all, he knew that God would not fail him in his need. He wrote, I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Okay, let's face it. Life can be very unfair. You can read all of Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and 9, which eloquently chronicles the unfairness of life. You see, people don't always get what they deserve, claimed King Solomon, the teacher. He said, good people often suffer, while the young and the wicked people prosper. Everything seems determined only by time and chance. Solomon, in Ecclesiastes 3.20, said, man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from the dust, and to dust all return. In contrast, the New Testament is filled with hope because the writers knew that there was much more to come. They eventually came to realize that we really do win in the end. If you were watching a baseball game on television and your favorite team appeared to be losing, you would have doubts about their skill, wouldn't you? Their resolve, their coaching. But if it were a replay of the game and you already knew that they had won, your whole attitude would be different as you watched because you knew that it would be changed and finally they would win. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the very essence of faith. No matter how things may look to you at the moment. The end result is promised victory. And the secret to freeing oneself from doubt is found in Isaiah 40, 31. I urge you to paste a copy of this on your bathroom mirror and memorize it. It says in Isaiah 40, 31, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. One important word of caution, however, listen to James 1, 6. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Let me sum up today's message. It is normal for anyone to be filled with doubts. Everyone has experienced them down through history. We are not unique. Christian believers have so many fantastic promises from God, including our own resurrection, that we don't have to be beaten down by doubts. Now, if you have not surrendered your life, your fears, and your doubts to the Savior, then you're missing out on a gift that lasts far beyond today's troubles, far beyond the grave. Trust in God and let him deal with your doubts like Paul did in Romans 15, 13. I desire, he said, that the hope of God fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him 
that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul's going to also give us our closing prayer. <clears throat> You'll find it in Ephesians 3, verses 13 through 21, if you want to check it out later, in which Paul prays that doubt and discouragement will be conquered among the brethren. He said, In whom you also trusted, speaking of Jesus Christ, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, ceased not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Jesus Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him up at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come. We have no need to doubt. We have strength of the one who created us and created the entire universe and we have the promise of everlasting life. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then find a church nearby and speak to the pastor and pray the prayer of forgiveness. You can look that up on our program on salvation and become a believer in Jesus Christ. Until next time, this is R.T. Byram for Lambs TV asking God's blessing on you and on yours.